W5. Millions in dirty bills. Get ready, you are going to blow your mind. A secret bank cleaning stacks of drug money. Heavy bags uh, full of cash. And while authorities turn a blind eye. At the end of the day, the, the system didn't work. One man has had enough. You had suspicion that something was going on that was not legal. Correct. Kevin Newman with a W5 special investigation into BC's dirty money laundering secret. It was the largest money laundering investigation in Canadian history by a long shot. Casinos used to clean cash for parts unknown. Potentially Middle Eastern organized crime. A lucrative scheme that seemed unstoppable. There is a general attitude of don't upset the apple cart. Until our exclusive whistleblower risked it all. And that was the end of your career. Yes. And an enticing deal for new Canadians. Well, this is a life change for myself and my family. That promised more than just a new life. It was like a feeding trough and only certain people were invited to the trough. W5 looks at an immigration incentive gone wrong. PEI processing applications faster than most provinces. And the people who paid the ultimate price. I never dreamed that I would be persecuted to this level. For that one unanswered question. Who got all of this money? Here is Kevin Newman. Hello and thanks for joining us for two new investigations which have something in common. Politicians willing to look the other way as long as millions of dollars continue to pour in. In Prince Edward Island, a government program allowed mostly Chinese immigrants to easily pay their way into Canada. And in British Columbia, Chinese gamblers have contributed billions of dollars to that province's treasury using money that's been linked to organized crime. Now, in both cases, there were whistleblowers on the inside who thought something wrong was going on. And they have now agreed to speak exclusively to W5. You are about to meet a whistleblower. If people have been involved in criminal activity, then they should be in jail. Working inside British Columbia's casinos, he watched firsthand how millions of dollars of illegal money infiltrated the industry. No one wanted to ask the question where the money was coming from. He was the head of anti-money laundering for BCLC. That's the BC Lottery Corporation. I think that people are outraged in this province about what's occurred. In the back of my mind, I always believed that I wanted to expose this. His name is Ross Alderson. These individuals that were coming into the casinos, I knew this was a part of a much bigger problem in British Columbia. The public needed to know. A New Zealander, Ross Alderson moved to Australia, worked there as a cop for seven years. And after meeting and marrying a Canadian, he moved to Vancouver and began working for the BC Lottery Corporation, which is a crown corporation that oversees the privately owned casinos in the province. In 2011, Ross was assigned to work here as an investigator at the popular River Rock Casino in Richmond. What do you remember about day one on the job? Uh, shock. I'd heard stories about the volume of cash and things like that was coming through that place. But I think when you got there and, and you know, you're looking at uh, bags and bags of cash coming in on a daily basis, to me, it, uh, as a former police officer, I thought it was um, you know, just sort of defied logic. And you saw that your very first day in the job? Yep. And what struck me was that there was a culture in the industry that this was the norm. How much money are you watching move through there? There were people coming in with, you know, 10,000, 20,000, 100,000, 200,000. I mean, there was a buy-in of half a million dollars in cash at one point. You don't have to take his word for it. This is casino surveillance footage at the cash cage as gamblers arrive with bags of cash. Shopping bags, duffel bags, and nearly all of it in $20 bills. Not bundled the way a bank would do it, but with rubber bands, the way drug dealers bundle their cash. What troubled me the most was that no one was prepared to ask where the money was coming from. The larger players were, were mainly, a lot of them from mainland China. It was their culture to use cash. That's what you were told. That's what I was told. So don't question cash transactions. Yeah, and be offensive to these Millions. customers. These, these customers that uh, to ask them the question was where their money came from. 
you know, there were flight of capital laws in China restricting $50,000 essentially US coming out of the country a year and, and you, yet you have a Chinese national turning up at the casino with $300,000 in Canadian currency. Ross was pretty sure he knew the source of that cash. Organized crime, loan sharking to high roller mainland Chinese gamblers. Almost 100% of these individuals couldn't source their funds from a, what we deem as a legitimate source, like a banking institution or a, 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 some other financial institution. So they were flying into the country, picking up bags of money in some cases, mm -hmm. but they didn't know what the source of that money was. So a lot of these individuals were quite open that they weren't sure who they got their money from. Um, they were being paid in cash when they got there, and they would pay it back as a business transaction, either in Canada or in China. Ross also watched firsthand what's called refining, turning dirty small bills into clean cash. There was one occasion where an individual came in with 100,000 and twenties and walked out the door with 100,000 and hundreds. And he walked back in the following day with $20 bills and um, was doing the same thing. I escalated that to senior management and I was told uh, categorically it was not my job to investigate money laundering. Even though you had suspicion that something was going on that was not legal. Correct. In fact, as documents obtained by W5 show, the BC government was deluding itself it had no problems. This ministerial briefing note claims that a review of anti-money laundering measures in BC casinos found that the province has a robust anti-money laundering regime in place. The reality? Loan sharks prowled the floors. How easily could these high gambling customers from China access large amounts of money from what you saw? There were individuals within the high limit rooms that were loitering around and that's their sole purpose was to facilitate funds for these individuals. There were occasions and phone calls were made in the middle of the night and drop-offs occurred with cash. And- uh, Right on the property. Right on the property. The favorite game? Neuf à la banque. Baccarat. Bond. James Bond. You might recognize Three. it as James Bond's favorite card game, too. Eight. Huit à la banque. Nine. Neuf à la banque. And like in the Bond films, there are exclusive gaming rooms for the high rollers. W5 visited the River Rock with a hidden camera, tucked away not far from the lower limit gaming tables and slot machines. This private elevator takes gamblers to one of the exclusive VIP salons. Here, there are $100,000 limits per hand. The cash buy-ins over $10,000 were reported, listed on these internal suspicious transaction reports that were generated by BC's gaming policy and enforcement branch. Body in, $20,000, 210s, 890-20s, Four, $520 bills $1,435 20s and $26 $10,000 using $520. and ten dollars two hundred fives, four hundred one tens, four thousand two hundred and fifty twenties. Reported, filed, but never investigated. Did you have the impression that anybody was really interested in following the money trail? No, I mean, I, I, I filed the reports and never got any feedback back on, on those reports if anything was being done. Now there had been a task force made up of RCMP and local forces that was supposed to investigate casinos, but it was shut down in 2009. Peter German is a former RCMP deputy commissioner, an expert in fighting money laundering. He left the force in 2012. There was an integrated gaming unit that was funded by the province that operated until 2009, and it was shut down by the province. Uh, there was still the RCMP Proceeds of Crime Unit. Those units were abolished in 2013 uh, by the RCMP. After 2013, there, there was nobody. That's remarkable. I mean, you have all of these agencies that are collecting evidence of large transactions, and yet the enforcement branch has been shut down. Essentially, that's, that's correct, yes. And this type of crime takes a lot of expertise and a fair number of people. That's the problem. You need to have a dedicated unit dealing with that, and it has to be sort of a, a cross-disciplinary group of people that have got expertise in law, accounting, investigative techniques, and so forth. 
By 2015, the amounts of cash were overwhelming. Government documents obtained by W5 show monthly cash buy-ins in the millions. In one month, July of 2015, they top $20 million, with nearly 15 million of that in 20s. Vancouver Point Grey. Honorable Speaker, the BC Lottery Corporation used to provide a million dollars a year to the RCMP. To David Eby was the opposition NDP critic asking questions. So, Honorable Speaker, will the Solicitor General stand up and announce that this government will refund the RCMP casino policing team? Basically, I was told it's functionally impossible to launder money through BC casinos because of all these controls we have. It turned out to be incredibly wrong because the money laundering was happening outside the front door of the casino, not in the casino. And the issue was that everyone was uh, uh, willfully blind to these, where the money was coming from, these stacks of $20 and $50 bills that were coming into the casinos. Around the same time, Ross Alderson was promoted to being in charge of anti-money laundering for the entire BC Lottery Corporation. Given what you had seen, how determined were you to use the authority of your new position uh, to do more? I sent out a number of directives through the course of 2015 particularly um, about new programs that were coming in, that were interviewing people, um, that individuals would be prohibited from using cash until their source of funds was conf confirmed. And, you know, that was not uh, very popular initially. And uh, What do you mean by that? What kind of blowback did you get? Well, I heard from uh, an executive of BCLC. One of the first calls they got was from a, a former executive um, saying that we're going to kill the industry. In November 2016, Ross presented this report to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, and the stats were not pretty a steady rise of suspicious transaction reports. At casino after casino, suspicious cash dominated the business. How did your superiors react to the fact that you were beginning to answer the question that this is very, very dirty money? I think there was, uh, you know, there was a, some shock there for a start, but I think they realized that at some point this was all gonna be public, so they had to do something. I don't really think they had a choice. So what the province decided to do Let's bring back the cops. On April 11th, 2016, JIGIT is formed. That's the Joint Illegal Gaming Investigation Team, and it was led by the RCMP. These dedicated resources can focus their entire attention on illegal gaming and laundering money throughout the province here. By now, those bags of cash had even attracted the attention of an elite federal squad dedicated to fighting organized crime. I think I made it quite clear that I would provide them information as much as I could. You know, they could pick up the phone and call me. Were the police happy for what you were contributing? Absolutely they were. I met with them probably on a weekly basis. So they felt that you were contributing? Yes. A dark bank is uncovered. Let's get some prosecutions here. Let's get some individuals named and, and shamed. But somehow avoids justice. It didn't surprise me. When W5 continues. October 15th, 2015, on the third floor of this building in Richmond, BC, is the office of Silver International. A security camera captures the exact moment heavily armed RCMP execute a search warrant in a case they call ePirate. It will become the biggest money laundering investigation in Canadian history. These evidence photos obtained by W5 reveal a secret illegal bank, one that's been supplying gamblers at BC casinos with bags of cash, millions of dollars. Behind the bulletproof glass are two safes loaded with $2 million, mostly in 20s. There are cash counting machines, suitcases and bags, computers and dozens of cell phones evidence seized at Silver International and from nine other locations. A bounty, W5 has learned, RCMP officers were eager to show the public. This is a never shared image of officers rehearsing a news conference where they would reveal the bust. And to drive home its magnitude, they displayed the more than $7.2 million seized during their raids. 
But then, W5 has learned, at the last minute, RCMP headquarters ordered the news conference canceled. Once again, keeping how big BC's money laundering problem had become a secret. I was pushing for, get, let's get some prosecutions here. Let's get some individuals named and, and shamed, essentially, to, to change the, the culture of this industry. Right from when he first started working as a casino investigator, Ross Alderson was pushing to stop the bags of cash. As head of anti-money laundering for the BC Lottery Corporation, he urged police to investigate the source of that illegal money. And one name stood out, Paul Jin. What kind of information were you able to supply uh, police authorities that was helpful? Suspicious transaction reports were linked to individuals that were associated to him. He first sort of came on the radar around 2012. And uh, at that point, I believe he was banned as an undesirable around that time. So very early, once they were aware of him, right? Yep. In Richmond's Chinese community, Paul Jin had found notoriety for operating a massage parlor at this hotel. In this hidden camera exchange with CTV Vancouver, he offered sexual services to a would-be client. And that includes the hand release? Yeah, yeah. Okay. According to court documents obtained by W5, in April 2015, the RCMP commenced an investigation into Paul King Jin's involvement in laundering proceeds of crime and loan sharking. Along with others, Jin was seen coming and going from Silver International with airline-style luggage and or boxes. When I was told of the location, it didn't surprise me. It's very close location to the River Rock and that sort of fitted the MO of what we'd seen with uh, deliveries and so forth. Police surveillance teams watched the building. These surveillance notes logged Paul Jin's movements at Silver International and driving around Richmond. Getting a bag from his car, he hands it to an unidentified woman. She gives that same bag to a man who police follow to the River Rock Casino, where he buys in with $99,900, more than half of it in bundled 20s, and begins to play baccarat in the VIP room. Court documents also allege that Silver International is linked to multinational drug trafficking. This industrial park was under surveillance by Vancouver police. According to this affidavit, they were watching a high-level drug trafficker and importer who supplied multi-kilogram drug traffickers with cocaine in the greater Vancouver area. Surveillance photos track the suspects, including to the Pacific Business Centre and Silver International, where police claim millions of dollars of drug proceeds were deposited at the illegal bank. It was quickly apparent to police that Silver International was ground zero of money laundering in British Columbia. Just how much money can be seen on this video obtained by W5, taken from Silver International's own security cameras. It's closing time, but one staff member is waiting for a special customer. We've sped up the video a bit. The client brings in a suitcase, and then together they unpack bundles of $20 bills you're watching an underground bank deposit. Each bundle is $20,000. And by the time they're done, $1.4 million sits on the floor. And it'll remain there all night because there's nowhere else to put the cash. The safes under the desk are full. Those bags by the window are also full of cash. The floor was the only place left to stack it. This is only days before the RCMP raid Silver International. Just how much money was confirmed in the financial ledgers written in Chinese? A spreadsheet translated by RCMP officers tracked cash in and cash out. Day after day, hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars. According to a police affidavit, more than $220 million a year drug money in, laundered money out. Police estimated that the total impact of that cash was $1.2 billion a year. And internal RCMP documents obtained by W5 reveal how it worked. Money from drug dealers was being deposited into Silver International. 
Some of that cash would be loaned to gamblers and to money exchanges, who would repay their debts to one of 600 Silver International Bank accounts located in China. And from there, that money would be transferred to drug suppliers of fentanyl in China, cocaine in Peru and Mexico, and then those drugs shipped to Canadian drug dealers to start the entire cycle all over again. It even has a name, the Vancouver model. So, so there was a source of illicit funds here in British Columbia right. that these Chinese gamblers could come to Vancouver to access. Right. And what was the source of those illicit funds? Drug money. Peter German is a former deputy commissioner of the RCMP who literally wrote the book on money laundering. We may also have been laundering uh, money for other uh, offshore entities. Mexico, particularly the Sinaloa cartel, has been mentioned, and potentially Middle Eastern organized crime uh, involvement. Uh, and uh, so Vancouver became essentially certain aspects. Parts of Vancouver became a laundromat for, for money for organized crime domestically and internationally. Questionable cash cleaned through casinos. These criminals see us as an easy target. Yet no one seems to care. The regulator wasn't regulating. The police weren't policing. When W5 continues. July of 2017. A new NDP government is sworn in in British Columbia. The Attorney General, given oversight over the province's casinos, is David Eby. In opposition, he'd asked tough questions about casinos awash in cash. Now, he had the power to do something about it. I still remember clearly the regulator responsible for gambling in BC saying, get ready, you were going to blow your mind. And none of my other briefings started, started that, that way. way. Yeah, so they walked me through uh, their belief that there was large-scale transnational money laundering taking place in BC casinos. They showed me videos of people walking in, uh, heavy bags uh, full of cash uh, to casinos. And uh, the reason they said, we think this is going to blow your mind, is because they knew that this had not been part of the public discussion in British Columbia, that people were not aware that this was happening. EB was hearing what Ross Alderson had been telling his bosses over six frustrating years. I always believed that I wanted to expose this, and I just had to wait for the right time. And to me, that right time was when the provincial government changed. You believed that the public had to know. I was connecting all the dots behind the scene too, and I knew this was a part of a much bigger problem in British Columbia. In 2016, Ross had given a presentation to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, it showed how much suspicious money was coming into casinos. With details about the top 100 players, 97% of them of Asian descent, mostly working in real estate, but also gambling millions in cash each year, housewives and students. Ross leaked his report to a reporter. BC's dirty money laundering secret was now out in the open. There were any number of people who could have been the source of that information that was made public. Yeah. You chose to own it. Yeah. Why? I felt like I'd done what I needed to do to get the story out. And that was the end of your career? Yes. And nobody said no to taking this money. With the scope of the problem now revealed to the public, David Eby moved quickly to appoint former RCMP Deputy Commissioner Peter German to conduct a review of the province's anti-money laundering policies. Your first line here is, for many years, certain lower mainland casinos unwittingly served as laundromats for the proceeds of organized crime. How widespread was it? That certainly, uh, that was my findings. Um, I did describe one particular casino as the epicenter of what was taking place. That's a River Rock casino. Yes. But it wasn't just a single casino. According to German, the failure was systemic. I'm critical of the entire system wasn't working. So the regulator wasn't regulating, the police weren't policing, and BCLC was the de facto uh, anti-money laundering uh, entity, and yet nobody said no. So at the end of the day, the, the system didn't work. In part because they put profit ahead of policing, a billion dollars a year in revenue from casinos was flowing into provincial coffers. 
There was a massive turf war, wasn't there? The government was making money from it. And so I believe um, that there was a reluctance to address the issue because if you said, we're not going to accept this money, then that has revenue implications for BC Lottery Corporation and by extension, the government, by extension, the people of British Columbia. EB at least had a public relations ace in the hole. Not long after he took office, the e-pirate case, that raid at the illegal bank, Silver International, had led to criminal charges. Kai Xuan Chin and her husband, Jian Jun Chu, were charged with laundering the proceeds of crime and failing to register a money services business. It was the largest money laundering investigation in Canadian history by a long shot. W5 has learned that more than 30 police officers spent two years connecting the dots. It cost Canadian taxpayers more than $10 million to bring those two suspects before a judge. And then, only weeks before their trial was set to begin, the public learned that the charges and the case were being put on hold. Stayed, according to W5 sources, because prosecutors accidentally disclosed information which could have revealed the identity of a secret informant. These people are able to walk through a casino with hockey bags full of $100 bills, and no one blinks an eye. And when we do finally have a court case to hold people accountable, it falls apart between, before our very eyes. Brad West is the mayor of Port Coquitlam, that's a Vancouver suburb, and he's been saying openly what many British Columbians are angry about. It's appalling, actually, and it speaks to the just complete absence of leadership, of moral leadership. Why do you think that is? Well, I think a, a lot of people were quite happy with the status quo. Government gets a cut of, uh, of money that comes through the casino, and I think there is a general attitude of don't upset the apple cart. Because it's a billion bucks going into the treasury every year. That's right. We're getting a horrible reputation around the world as a place where you can come and wash dirty money. And while scenes like these are less frequent at BC's casinos now, with gamblers forced to declare their source of their cash and to use bank drafts, there are fears even those have been corrupted. Can you say with confidence right now that this has been shut down? Oh, no, the casinos are just one part of a larger money laundering structure that takes place in British Columbia. Um, and we have profound concerns about real estate, about luxury cars, and we're currently looking at uh, the horse racing industry uh, in BC as well. Organized crime's involved with cash. It's all about cash, and money laundering's about cash. It could really go to any cash-based business. So maybe what we should be looking at is more holistically. If we have the right enforcement uh, in place, if we have the right regulations in place, the right laws in place, that we enforce our, our laws, both criminal and regulatory, then you don't have to follow this money to each sector uh, and, you know, essentially chase it around. And I think that's where, you know, we're falling down as maybe Canadians, as well as to a certain extent British Columbians, is that we don't have those necessary enforcement regulatory mechanisms in place to deal with this. Ross Alderson is now watching it all from the sidelines. He hasn't found work since leaving the BC Lottery Corporation, except as a tennis coach. Wait going forward. Nice. He'd been a seated player back in his native New Zealand. Yes, much better. I did my job to the best of my ability, and I also did my civic duty. I guess that's the way it goes. But he still worries Good. if anyone really gets it. I don't think anyone understands the scope. We've gone from um, a few million dollars being laundered, you know, a year ago, what was known, to reports coming out just of this last week to perhaps billions of dollars. And not only in casinos, in real estate, luxury cars, no. horse racing, it's massive. I think it is massive. And BC's government has so far refused to bow to public pressure for a full public inquiry into money laundering.